This is the final video of the nuclear tests at the Semipalatinsk nuclear test site. There is little information about the events that took place there on the internet. This is the third part of the video. If you have not seen parts 1 and 2, I advise you to do so. The link to the video will be in the attached commentary. In the 60s the era of aerial testing was a thing of the past. Khrushchev and US President John F. Kennedy agreed that only underground tests not exceeding 10 megatons were possible. On October 10, 1963 the Moscow Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapon Tests in the Atmosphere, in Outer Space and Underwater came into force. One of its requirements was that after a nuclear explosion there must be no fallout outside the borders of the testing state. For some reason there were discrepancies in the bilingual versions. For example, the Russian version banned underground nuclear explosions resulting in radioactive fallout while the English text banned underground nuclear explosions resulting in debris. Both texts had the same legal force. Two interpretations of the treaty emerged, and the Americans sometimes tried to make claims against the Soviet Union for violating the treaty using the English text. The USSR, understandably, rejected these claims. The borders of the exclusion zone of the test site were expanded for underground nuclear explosions, in this area, an underground nuclear explosion later resulted in the creation of an artificial body of water Lake Chagan, or, as the Kazakhs called it, Adam Cole, Atomic Lake, at the confluence of the Chagan and Ashsu, Ashkaisu, rivers. Yefim Slavsky, Minister of Medium Machine Building, and one of the initiators of the Chagan project, was the first to bathe in it. However, almost no one followed his example. To this day, Local residents are afraid to fish there, and shepherds drive their herds to one particular place to drink. Fishermen tell tales of monsters over two meters long and fish with glowing heads. Boy, you should be in your grave by now. Like space exploration, the success of the first tests was followed by the failures of the next. The seventh ultra-low power explosion on August 28, 1964, ended in an accident. Eyewitnesses remembered the depressing scene, the gas flow through rails, beams, ventilation equipment and other structural debris onto the added site. Immediately after the explosion high radiation levels appeared at the added technological site. At the test on September 30th of that year, it happened again. My dad worked in this field and regularly went to Semipalatinsk for tests, said Gennady Moskalyov from Moscow. He was in charge of rocket engines, he was the head of the expedition at the Baikal 1 booth complex. He brought radiation dust on his clothes. It was breathed by me, my sister, and my mother. Dad ended up living only 62 years, although his parents lived over 80. I myself studied at the Department of Aircraft Engines at the MAI. I was sent to military service just to the Semipalatinsk nuclear test site. Those were the years of 1985 to 1987. Our unit was in the steppe. We ate, drank and breathed radiation. Thirteen years later, when Moskalyov was already working as a general director of a real estate company, he began having health problems. His symptoms coincided with those suffered by people exposed to radiation. For example, autonomic nervous system disorders began. He says that in his body not a lethal dose, but it is seven times higher than the maximum allowable. At 59, the man was already disabled of the third group. According to him, it is very difficult for the victims of the tests to get benefits from the state. Moskalev believes that the underground tests are no less dangerous than atmospheric tests and are comparable to a magnitude 6 earthquake. Even the earth was cracking. I felt these tremors in my unit, he recalled. After the underground explosions, radiation was getting into the underground waters. It was all going up into the Irtish. The cows were pinching grass with radiation. Back then, the Semipalatinsk meat processing plant, large even by the standards of the USSR, was still in operation. 
I believe the stew was contaminated with radiation. People were drinking contaminated water from wells. Valery Mermelo from Nikolaev served with me. Years later he told me a story about how one day he came back from the artillery range and felt bad. In the medical unit they analyzed him, boy, you should be in your grave by now. They sent him to a hospital in Semipolotinsk, then to Almaty. My army friend was dying slowly, his kidneys were failing. He was discharged and my mother took him home. At the Nikolaev military hospital Valery was still getting out in two years. In 1988, a government commission, headed by Igor Belusov, deputy chairman of the USSR Council of Ministers for Defense Affairs, arrived in the Kazakh SSR. Its purpose was to assess the situation around the Semipolotinsk test site and find out the mood of the population. At a meeting with the local leadership, Nursultan Nazarbayev, chairman of the Council of Ministers of the Kazakh SSR, stressed that during the period of testing, especially in the early 1950s, the population of several villages near the border of the test site received a significant dose of radiation. Before returning to Moscow, members of the commission visited a regional hospital in one of the villages. They were shown dozens of seriously ill children. We visited many villages around the polygon and were shown cracks in the window panes that appeared as a result of underground explosions. Of course, all that depressed the population, recalled Yuri Israel, member of the commission and chairman of the USSR State Committee for Hydrometeorology and Environmental Control. The poverty of people was striking. The secretary of the Semipolotinsk Regional Party Committee told me that recently there have been cases of suicide among young people. Israel compared the situation to the United States, where the authorities spared no expense to create decent conditions in communities near the Nevada test site and the local population ended up being relatively loyal to the tests. In 1989, a Soviet-American non-governmental organization called Nevada Semipolotinsk united the residents of the vicinity of the two test sites. The Semipolotinsk test site was closed in 1991. On August 29, just a few days after the failure of the putsch in Moscow, Nazarbayev, as president of the Kazakh SSR, signed a decree to that effect. The document stressed that since 1949 about 500 nuclear explosions had been carried out at the NNWS, which damaged the health and lives of thousands of people. Because of the nuclear tests, a number of regions in Kazakhstan and Russia were subjected to powerful radiation contamination, which negatively affected the health of the first, second, third, and subsequent generations of residents. The total radioactive contamination of the former Soviet Union amounted to 50 Chernobyls. The population of the Semipolotinsk Gulag was subjected to grave human rights violations. There was a nuclear war going on in Siberia. Subscribe to the channel and share this video with your friends. Give it a thumbs up. Write in the comments about what else interesting you can tell about this video. See you in the new video.